Welcome to today's lesson where we are going to be looking at some of the ways that different species interact with one another. And there are classifications for these kind of interactions. In general, we say that an interaction between two or more species is called an interspecific interaction. And those kinds of interactions can be positive, they can bring good things to the species, or they can be negative, they can remove fitness from the individual, or they could be neutral. So typically, we're going to be describing the balance, whether an interaction is good or bad, as a positive or a negative. So for example, when we talk about predation, we have this picture of a bird up here eating the fish. This is an example of predation, and this is considered positive, negative. Positive for the bird, it gets some food. Negative for the fish, because now it's dead. Okay, competition. Competition is actually a lose-lose situation. Animals want to get out of competition. They either want to outcompete their competitor until it dies, and then they're no longer in competition, or they want to specialize in such a way that they remove the competition. An example of this is the lion and the hyena here in this picture. You might think that they are in competition for the same food, but in reality, they partition their resources. Very rarely would a hyena and a lion eat the exact same food. Lions are more likely to kill large animals and they eat part of that animal, but then there are other parts that they would not eat and scavengers like hyenas then come in and eat it. They have partitioned resources. If they were in direct competition, that's bad for both because every time the hyena gets something to eat, that specifically decreases the fitness of the lion and vice versa. And so what we see in nature is that we tend to see a reduction in competition by specialization, okay, reaching your specific niche market, or by just out-competing until the other individual is no longer a competition because it's gone extinct or left the environment. Another type of predation is herbivory. And so here we have a monarch caterpillar eating a leaf, and that is also similar, a win-lose situation, good for the butterfly, but bad for the plant. Before we totally leave the concept of predation, I wanna talk a little bit about the predator-prey relationship. It's a really interesting relationship. Um, it's different than competition because they don't necessarily lose lose. The prey don't lose all together. They have to stay alive or else the predator loses. This drives them in this kind of co-evolution, which means, and we use the example of the roadrunner and wily coyote, the roadrunner gets faster, so the coyote has to get faster or more cunning. And then the roadrunner gets more cunning, so the coyote has to come up with a better plan. The roadrunner gets faster, so the coyote has to get faster. They kind of drive each other in their evolution. If we see, and we're gonna look over here, um, that predators and prey are locked in this kind of graph together. And what's gonna happen is that the prey are gonna increase in their numbers. Maybe this means that there's lots of water and lots of grass or food, for the prey, and their, so their numbers are gonna come up. And what follows that is lagging just a little bit behind it, we would see the predator's numbers start to rise. But as the predator's numbers get high, they start to consume more of the prey, and so the prey numbers are gonna fall. When the prey numbers fall, the predators no longer have enough food, and so their numbers are gonna fall. So this is not enough food. This is lots of food, right? And remember the food is the prey. The prey grow when there's lots of food, but they start to die when there's too many predators. And so we start to see this evolution where on this fall, we're selecting for the best at getting away. And on the fall of the predators, we're selecting for the best at catching the prey. And so year after year, cycle after cycle, what we do is select for better and better and better at catching prey. 
and better and better and better at getting away. And so because of that, we start to see this co-evolution that really fits the predator to the prey in such a way that they work well together. It might be way too fast for some other predator, or way too cunning for some other prey, but together they actually end up making a very, very good battle, consistent battle for supremacy. Predator, prey, locked in coevolution, we see some kind of interesting defenses of the prey. So they come up with different adaptations. One could be something like a mechanical defense, and this would be something like a porcupine or a chuckawalla or a puffer fish that has some sort of physical way to prevent being eaten. Both puffer fishes and chuckawallas can puff up to fill a crack or a space so it makes it hard for a predator to grab them. Obviously, a porcupine has the defense of its quills. Chemical defenses, things like a skunk having a really terrible smell, or you could also consider things like toxic slime on amphibian or frog that would keep things from eating it because they wouldn't want to get sick. Another chemical defense is used in monarch butterflies. Uh, the monarch butterfly eats a toxic plant, the milkweed, as it's in its pupal stages. And then once it's a butterfly, it's actually toxic. It will make you throw up if you went to go eat it, and that deters predators from eating them. Some prey decide to use something called cryptic coloration. Cryptic, like hard to read. Like if a person is cryptic, they're difficult for you to understand or for you to read. Cryptic coloration means that they might really well blend in. This is a stick bug up here and it's hard to see it. It blends into its surroundings. It's well camouflaged. Another kind of coloration that comes out of this is called aposematic. And aposematic coloration is really bright in your face coloration that serves as a warning to you. The monarch butterfly is an example. They're bright orange. They are hard to miss, which is good because what they're telling you is, here I am, and if you eat me, I will make you super sick. And so you don't want to eat them. You can see them, you can recognize them, and you avoid them. That leads itself to two other kinds of mimicry. So a mimic is someone who copies you, right? Batesian mimicry is where a non-poisonous species looks like a poisonous species. And this is considered plus minus. It's good for the organism that's not poisonous and it's bad for the organism that is. The way that this works is you would have two different, let's say snakes with similar color pattern. One being poisonous and one not. Well, the one that's poisonous gets diluted because a bird, let's say, that eats the snake, if it eats the non-poisonous snake, it doesn't learn to avoid them. So they're brightly colored, but that makes them a target. So let's use a specific example. Two pictures here. One is a king snake and one is a coral snake. King snakes are not dangerous, not at all, no problem. Coral snakes are quite dangerous. And what you can see is that they're both banded patterns of red, yellow, and black. But there's a difference. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little rhyme that will help you. It says, red before yellow, your one dead fellow. So let's look at their color. This one goes black, yellow, red, yellow, black, yellow, red, yellow. So red before yellow, your one dead fellow. This guy up here is a coral snake and he will kill you. Down here, our pattern goes yellow, black, red, black, yellow, black. Red before black, you're all right, Jack. That's what it says. So red before yellow, you're one dead fellow. Red before black, you're all right, Jack. That means that this one down here is a king snake and that one is not dangerous. So if you're walking through Yosemite Valley and you run into one of these snakes, you can remember red before yellow, you're one dead fellow, red before black, you're all right, Jack. Or you could remember that in Yosemite Valley, there's actually only king snakes, so you don't need to worry about it. There's no coral snake there. But in places where there are coral snakes, red before yellow, you're one dead fellow. And this is called Batesian mimicry, because if you were around a coral snake, 
and you tried to interact with it and someone who you loved or your animal or whatever was killed by the coral snake, you would learn to leave it alone. Unfortunately, if the first time you played with a snake, it was a king snake and it was very friendly and it was no problem, then you didn't learn your lesson. So that's bad for the coral snake, but it's good for the king snake. Another type of mimicry is called Malurian mimicry, and this is where two dangerous species look alike, and this makes a synergistic increase in the effectiveness because no one wants to be around them because they're both really dangerous. It's good for both of their fitness that they have this mimicry. Aside from predation, another kind of interspecific interaction is competition. We already mentioned that competition is a lose-lose situation. In competition, for any one competitor to win, the other one has to lose. And just because you won this meal doesn't mean you get to win the next meal. And so it's this constant battle. Being in competition is exhausting. What is so much better than being in competition is getting out of competition. And so there are two ways to do that. One is called competitive exclusion. So what happens in competitive exclusion is uh, this is an example here where we have two different kinds of bacteria blue and purple if we put them into the same tube one wins and the other dies competitive exclusion we end up with a tube full of just blue bacteria they outcompete the purple bacteria and they kill them off the other is called resource partitioning in resource partitioning the two species learn to coexist by getting more specialized in a particular way. Maybe they prefer the warmer or colder, more sunlight or less sunlight, early in the morning or late at night, they change what kind of resources they go after so that they continue getting the resources that they need and they can both survive. An extension of resource partitioning is the ecological niche. And so what happens here is you might have a bunch of organisms that live in a same space. And instead of competing directly with one another, they might slightly specialize so that they do not need to compete. For example, these are a bunch, these are five different types of birds that live in the same tree the Cape May warbler, black Murian warbler, black-throated green warbler, yellow-rumped warbler, and the bay-breasted warbler. So these are all songbirds. Warblers means that they're a songbird. And they each live in different parts of the tree. So the yellow-rumped warbler you might find in the bottom of the tree eating things that have fallen on the ground, ants and bugs that are in the bottom where the Cape May warbler maybe is eating fruits and berries off the tree itself. They're all able to live on the same tree because they have specialized on what exactly they will be consuming. And so this formation of the niche is a really nice way for species to specialize in order to decrease their competition, which is the, the idea, because remember competition is a lose-lose situation. Our third and final type of interspecific interaction is called symbiosis. And before we said we'll come back to this because symbiosis can be win-win, win-lose, or win-not depending on what kind of symbiotic relationship we're talking about. The first one is mutualistic. So this is an interaction that benefits both. This bird living in the crocodile's mouth is an example of mutualism. What it does is it picks the food out of the teeth. That gives it a food source and it keeps the crocodile healthy. Uh, a pollinator with a flower, this is another example, but this is the kind of thing that benefits both organisms. A second kind of symbiosis is parasitism. A parasite steals the host's nutrients. A tick or a tapeworm are examples of these, and this is a win for the parasite and a lose for the host. So when a tick bites you and sucks your blood, that is a lose for you. You are losing nutrients and energy. And although a single tick bite, gross as it may be, is not going to kill you, hundreds or 
a thousand ticks on an animal could really start to drain their blood. And that's why we have mutualistic animals that might live on a rhino and eat the tick bird, eat the ticks off of the rhino. And that provides a food source for the tick bird, but also keeps the rhino protected from the parasite, the tick. A third type of symbiotic interaction is commensalism. In commensalism, it's win nothing, okay? So in this kind of case, we have uh, a fish that hangs out with a shark. And this fish eats the kill, the leftover chunks and pieces of a kill after the shark is done. It's good for the fish, but it's zero for the shark. The shark doesn't care whether this fish does eat or doesn't eat what's left over. It makes no difference to the shark. Another example would be a barnacle attached to a whale. It's gonna eat things that it comes into contact with because it's traveling with the whale, but it really serves no purpose for the whale. It neither helps it nor hurts it, it's zero. So mutualism, good for both. Parasitism, good for the parasite, bad for the host. Commensalism, good for one species, but zero or neutral for the other. So these are the ways things can interact. They're either predators and prey, they are competitors, or they have some sort of symbiotic relationship with one another. When we come back tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about how you might conserve all of these species. You can see that they're so important in the environment. You can't study a species alone. Remember, that was our idea behind ecology in the first place. We can't just look at one species at a time. We have to look at the whole biome, the whole ecology, and get an idea of how they all work together. So tomorrow, we'll talk about how we can keep the species diversity in order to keep all of these interspecific interactions intact.